Welcome back, guys, to the JPS podcast. And this episode is a little different to our usual installments where I interview various guests and instead is a Q&A session from the JPS online mentorship course with James Krieger. So cheeky little plug here, our mentorship course is for personal trainers and coaches looking to improve their knowledge, their skills, and their tool sets uh, so that they can better help their clients get results. And we have a number of presenters from a variety of fields uh, contributing to the mentorship course, and James is one of them, along with Danny Lennon and Brian Miner and many, many more. So this Q&A is all the questions that our mentorship students had the opportunity to ask on our online group and James goes into great depth in answering their questions so I'm sure you guys will get a lot out of it. So again if you're a coach and you're looking to take your career to the next level and you want to learn more about the science and its application in the real world check out the link in the description box below to find out more about our course and whether or not you think it's right for you. So without further ado, let's get into things. All right, guys, welcome back to the Q&A. And this time, uh, I'm honored to have James Krieger on. There are a lot of really good questions uh, asked, so let's get straight into it. Welcome, James. Thanks for having me. So first question uh, is in relation to your talk at the UABC about minimizing muscle damage uh, by managing exercise selection. So can you please explain very good manners there, Declan. Uh, when you would actually implement these more damaging exercises and under what circumstances? And he gives an example of an RDL. Uh, he feels he could induce a lot of muscular damage and be sore for multiple days by completing this exercise with wide variance of loads and volumes. However, sometimes quite far away from failure, should this or similar exercise be substitute for more concentric focus exercises if this more, more damaging exercise reduces the ability to perform sufficient volume and or frequency. Maximal hypertrophy is the goal. Go for it, James. So, yeah, that's a really great question. And um, it's kind of a catch-22 in a sense because sometimes the more damaging exercises um, sometimes can also cause more hypertrophy because they will also create that tension at longer muscle lengths. And we know at least from some data, I mean, that's why training with a full range of motion in some case, not all cases, but some cases tends to cause more hypertrophy than others. Like for example, leg extension, we know the data is very clear on that. You know, if you do partial leg extensions, you won't get as much hypertrophy as if you did full range leg extensions. Um, uh, even though you're training the you know you're training the muscle to longer muscle length and theoretically it would be a little bit more damaging. Um, so how to implement those exercises? Um, I think the best way is to um, I think it's important to have those exercises because of the fact that you are training those muscles at longer muscle lengths, and I think you need to have some of that in your training program if you want to maximize overall hypertrophy. But I think it's also a matter of controlling the volume um, and perhaps keeping the, the session volume on a lower end, but training a little bit more frequently. That way you get that repeated bout effect. Um, and so it won't be as damaging. Like if you train those, those exercises too infrequently, then you won't get that, you don't get as much of the repeated bout effect and you're gonna get sore every time you do those exercises. But, but if you keep the, the session volume, on the low end and but you know maybe keep the frequency a little bit higher um you can at least get some of that repeated bout effect so um awesome, awesome. all righty next question do you think there's a set guideline when novices should reduce volume intensity and frequency with the goal of recovery even if they don't feel as if they need it are you proactive in managing fatigue or do you tackle it when the client tends to feel the effects of cumulative fatigue? So this one's in relation to deloads. Uh, James, what do you think? Yeah, so that's actually a great question and it really comes down to um, really proactive versus reactive deloads. And there's different schools of thought there. For example, I know Menno Henselman's is more in favor of reactive deloads. You know, you only deload when you actually start to see a performance decrement or you feel that you need it. Um, 
but there are other um, people out there that are more in favor of, of uh, proactive deloads where you actually have planned deloads to prevent any you know, issues from occurring in the first place. Um, I think the answer to that question depends upon your volume and intensity and things like that. If you're training with a lot of volume um, or you're training with you know, really high loads um, uh, with a fair amount of volume, I would say that it's probably better to do some proactive deloads um, because that type of training, especially with the heavy loads, um, tends to beat up your joints. And by the time you start getting joint pain, that's probably a little bit too late. Mm -hmm. So I would say in those type of situations, it's better to probably do a proactive deload. If you're training more in the bodybuilding ranges, um, your volume's not too excessive. Um, and if it's a novice and they're feeling pretty good, I would say you could, you're probably fine with just doing reactive deloads. You know, perhaps when you start to see a, a performance plateau um, or if the client just starts to, you know, they're feeling fatigue or they're not looking forward to their training sessions, things like that. Um, then I think a more reactive deload probably uh, works better. But, but I don't think there's any right or wrong answer. Uh, I think it really just depends on the situation. Yeah, and I would just add to that. I think most novices won't really need a deload until they actually start to feel like significantly fatigued and that fatigue, like you're starting to detriment their performance. Yeah. Um, and given that we know that, you know, the potential for adaptation for novices is so high in many cases, you know, they, they could go months without, you know, having to deload because they're just progressing, recovering nicely and adapting as they should. Um, and I also think, you know, it depends on the the specific goal of the client. If they're training for powerlifting and they want to compete, you know, um, they need to be a little bit more proactive with managing fatigue simply because they have to perform on a given day. Um, whereas if they're just training for physique and, you know, look better naked, you know, you've got a lot more room to move and, you know, you could probably be more reactive. Brilliant answer, James. We'll plug along to the next question. So will genetics ultimately dictate one's full potential of muscle growth? And for the unlucky ones, which factors are or is important to consider to maximize hypertrophy? So does a specific variable, exercise selection, volume, frequency, tempo, rest, bear more weights or have greater importance over another variable? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, yes, genetics are ultimately gonna dictate your ceiling basically how far you can get. Um, some people just have a genetic capacity to go a lot further than others. Um, that said, you know, um, you know, let's say if you're a more unlucky genetic uh, person, um, what things can you do to at least uh, improve your chances of getting to that ceiling, wherever that, ce you know, even if that ceiling is lower, what, it, what do you do to improve your chances to get that ceiling and what variables are most important um, I would say the emerging data is suggesting that uh, assuming that you're training hard, you know, you, most of your sets are, you know, close to failure, you know, if you're training, you know, in a moderate to, to high repetition range, um, assuming you're training hard and assuming you're, you know, making an effort to progress, assuming those things are true, I would say that volume is going to be the most important variable. Um, if you look at the research, Volume certainly seems to be related to hypertrophy much more than things like exercise selection and frequency and uh, uh, tempo, things like that. Now, that's not to say those other variables don't matter. Um, you know, exercise selection um, can play a role in certain instances. Um, for example, um, I may be... Uh, I may uh, upset some people by saying this, but at least in my opinion, the deadlift is not a great hypertrophy exercise. I did a video I, on that I tend to share the same opinion with Menno Henselmans on that. People <clears throat> love to do deadlifts, but the range of motion is very limited. There's really not much of an eccentric component to it. Um, it's just not, a, you know, and I've seen a lot of real skinny small guys that can deadlift some serious weight. So, um, uh, so, so for example, deadlift, um, not the best choice of exercise for hypertrophy, for example. Uh, but, but there's plenty of other exercises that work great. Um, so exercise selection isn't totally critical. Um, frequency 
on a volume equated basis doesn't seem to play a huge role in hypertrophy. Um, so you just want to make sure you're training with a frequency that, that allows you to do the highest quality work. Um, and whether that's twice per week, three times per week, you know, things like that, um, for at least per muscle group, that's fine. Um, tempo doesn't seem to be much important unless you're at the extremes. So if you're training with really rapid tempos, like you're, you're basically dropping the weight, no eccentric at all, um, that's certainly detrimental for hypertrophy. Or on the other extreme, if you're doing super slow and you're really slow concentrics and stuff like that, that's also not going to be good for hypertrophy. But if you're somewhere in between very controlled eccentric, powerful concentric, you know, um, you know, you don't need necessarily need to be counting your, your, uh, you know, timing your reps. Um, you know, as long as you're really controlling that eccentric and really um, trying to do an explosive concentric action, um, you'll be fine. Um, and then as far as rest intervals, we know that rest intervals are longer rest intervals are, are better for hypertrophy, but you can also make up for short rest intervals by doing more sets to equate the volume. So, um, so not, that's not hugely critical. So, so out of all those variables you mentioned there, I mean, volume is really the big, um, the big factor. And, and, uh, the study that, that, uh, Brad and I, um, are, that's going to be out here. Actually, it should be out in a couple weeks, uh, the published ahead of print. Um, you'll see that that volume really played a role as far as whether people tended to be responders or not. So in the highest volume group, there were very few people that you would consider uh, non-responders. Um, but in the low volume group, there was a lot more people that didn't respond to the training, which suggests that that volume seems to be a big factor to play a role of whether you're going to um, be able to get closer to that ceiling or not. So. Awesome. And I'll just add to that. I think, this is my real uh, practical experience uh, shining through here. You know, you could have the best laid out program. And if you cannot execute that program in the gym, like your forms horrible, you know, you just, you aren't training with, you know, an appropriate amount of effort, like then you're not going to get anywhere near your genetic potential in terms of muscle growth. So I think, you know, understanding the variables and the role they play is like so important because that's the foundation. But I also think, you know, being able to execute a program consistently over time, that is, um, is what's going to lead to the best gains. So I just want to add that there, but that was brilliant, James. Yeah. Moving on. Next question is in regards to your recommendations for younger or new trainers when it comes to trial and error. More often than not, a theory is put out and one applies it not long before stopping halfway to implement something new that the research has just found. Could it be that people are not sticking to a method completely and as such results are not appearing? And what do you believe is the way to go? This is a really good question. Yeah, that is a great question. And uh, um, I, I'd say though, you have to give any, anything that you're doing, you've got to give it some time to work. And it also depends on what you're doing. For example, um, if it's something related to fat loss, you can tend to see results faster than if it's something related to muscle gain. You know, muscle gain happens just way slower than fat loss does. So, so it partly depends on what you're doing. Now, if it's something related to fat loss, I mean, if you're not seeing any results in three or four weeks, um, then, yeah, you probably need to change something or if something new comes out, maybe try something, you know. Muscle gain is a little bit tougher because it's so slow. Um, uh, and the thing is, is um, I, I think it depends on how the prog how progress is. You know, if progress is occurring, then I would say stick with what you're doing before you try to jump to something new. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, too many people are program hoppers. Well, they'll hop to one program, and uh, I have a neighbor like that. Like she, like <laughs> one, you know. Like I hear she's on one exercise program and then three weeks later, I hear she's totally doing something totally different. And like, uh, um, that doesn't, that doesn't work. Like you got to say something with consistently enough to know if you're progressing or not. If you're progressing, then I, I tend to take the approach. If, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's not to say you can't enhance some things, maybe tweak some things here or there. Um, but don't make any radical change. Um, if things are going just fine. Um, now, if things aren't, aren't progressing and it's been, you know, and I, like I said, you can go off performance improvements in the gym, even though it's hard to measure hypertrophy in such a short time. 
I mean, if the person's not improving in the gym and it's been four weeks and then some new data comes out, yeah, then go ahead and try the new thing, you know, because obviously you're not really progressing much anyway. But if you're pro progressing fairly well, then I'd say hold off before you try doing anything radically new. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I guess this was something I struggled with massively when I first started in the industry because, you know, I didn't know what, for example, intermittent fasting was, you know, I just learned about, you know, auto regulation and I wanted to throw all of these things, you know, into my uh, coaching practice um, whilst doing other things already. And, you know, I guess, I learned pretty quickly that you can't just overhaul what you're doing because people just go, what the hell is this guy? What is he doing? One week he wants me to do this and then the next we're doing that. Um, so I think, you know, slowly drip feeding new, you know, concepts into what you're doing in practice so that you're not completely overhauling what you're currently doing. Um, but making sure that you're refining what you're already doing and if you're adding things, you need to be measuring. You need to be really systematic in the way that you structure your practice. So, you know, you need to set parameters on cool. When do I expect to see progress, um, you know, for this? What, you know, what am I trying to get out of this approach? You know, when can I expect to see, you know, uh, progression, whether it's on the scale, uh, whether it's in the gym, you know, what rate of gain or loss do I want to be seeing? Um, and at what time frames? And then just making sure that you are, paying attention to what's happening um, throughout this process. And you'll see that over time, you know, you won't be having to add new things into what you're already doing. Um, you'll just be continually refining what you're, you're currently doing. Um, so I think, yeah, just be very systematic, have, you know, a process for how you go about these things and yeah, don't overhaul your program, you know, the way that you coach um, because, not only does it yeah, show a lot of uh, inconsistency and I guess lack of uh, you know, self-belief uh, to the client, um, but you, you're not really going to be able to measure or manage uh, anything that's going on. Yeah, I'll, I'll add one more thing to that too. Uh, at least something I, I like to do is um, if I am thinking about trying anything new with a client or clients, um, I actually will experiment with it on myself first. Mm -hmm. Um, because I want to at least know, okay, does it kind of seem to work? Not that, not that anything that works for me is going to work for my client, but I want to at least experience, get some experience with it so that I know if I'm going to, uh, you know, have my client do this, I want to at least have an idea of what it's like, yep. you know? So, so that's also something, you know, and that also gives you some time to experiment with something, um, before you start making changes to all your clients programs. So, yeah, that's brilliant. Does James have any recommended resources or names to look into for learning more about data analysis and stats? I've heard Will Hopkins work is good, but would be interested in hearing if James can confirm this. Yeah, no, um, if you go to Will's site, he's got a lot of good stuff on there. I mean, I know there's been controversy over the MBI thing, um, you know, which he was a supporter of, but if you know, if you ignore the MBI stuff, I mean, he's got all other just basic statistics stuff that, that makes it fairly easy to understand and learn. And he's got spreadsheets you can work with and things like that. Um, outside of Will's site, um, there's some pretty cool free software out there now uh, that you can use uh, that can really make statistics a lot easier. Um, one is called JASP, J-A-S-P. Um, and uh, it's totally free and it does a lot of the standard basic statistical analyses and it um, for you and it gives you descriptions on you know on the meaning of things and things like that so so that's a great tool um, uh, as far as anything else you know I, I can't really think of any others um, but I would say probably Will Hopkins Jazz are uh, are two really good places to start awesome Awesome. There you go for all you uh, stats nerds out there. Okay. General thoughts on when the appropriate time and place to implement training to complete failure RPE 10 and how would you place that in a program or if there are any real benefits to that type of training, either in high rep or low rep ranges? Um, I would say the best time for that type of training is for example, let's say a client is uh, getting close to a plateau or they're starting to plateau. Um, 
then you can do some RPE 10 training to kind of just see where they're at. Like, okay, where, you know, what's their true, you know, really push them, see if that actually uh, gets them a little bit further. Um, and then once they plateau at that, then you know, okay, we got to change something. We got to deload, we got to, or do something else mm -hmm. um, to stimulate progress again. So me, I think it's towards the, uh, when you start noticing plateaus in the training cycles, uh, when you can uh, push it to the next level, um, see how they respond. Um, and, you know, it, a lot of times it, you know, might stimulate some further progress and then, um, you know, and then after that you can, you know, make your changes. So. Yeah. Awesome. I, I agree with that. I've actually used that with some success on a few clients who are kind of stalling out and we, we push things a little bit harder and hey, presto, um, you know, progress kicked off again. I'd also just add that it's exercise selection dependent. So I wouldn't go to oh, yes. a yeah. failure on, on a deadlift um, or a squat or, you know, those big compound joints that, you know, train, uh, multiple muscle groups. Um, I would be more inclined to do that on, you know, machine work, isolation exercises, things with a lower risk of getting hurt essentially. Um, and also if you're, you know, if you have a proactive deload, so building off the, the earlier question, if you have a proactive deload, you can definitely start to, you know, train to failure. Uh, towards the back end of a meso cycle before you deload because you know that you're accumulating the fatigue but then you're going to drop that fatigue not long after so it's not too much of an issue but you know i guess i've seen in practice a lot of people make wicked gains training to failure every session you know the the, the bros they train once a week and i guess that's really important to consider um because their volume um, you know, within a session, so high, but their frequency is low. So they've got a lot of time to recover between their sessions. Um, but you know, if you're training really, really frequently, um, you know, so upwards of like three times a week with, you know, moderate volumes, high volumes, even you really need to keep a close gauge on, you know, how close to failure you're getting. A um, lot of considerations in this. It's not necessary to build muscle. Um, I've also had a lot of clients who have gotten pretty jacked and they train, I won't say sub maximally, but they train between like, you know, six to nine RPE for the most part, you know, they very rarely hit failure. Um, but then there's some clients who, you know, just love to push it um, in the gym and they hit failure, you know, semi frequently and they make wicked gains too. Could either of those individuals make better gains, you know, doing something different? Who knows? But um, you know, I think, yeah, if you're ticking the boxes of volume, you know, spread across appropriate frequencies with adequate effort and intensities and you're progressively overloading the program. Um, it's not necessary, but it can be useful in some circumstances for sure. Cool. Next question. I know you probably can't speak in too much detail, but is there anything we can look forward to in future research? Hint, hint, James, I think people want to know more about this study. Yeah. <laughs> Either you might be doing it or no, someone, someone is doing something new. Um, well, I, here's what I can tell you. Um, uh, the volume study is going to be uh, published here in the next few weeks. It'll be published out of print. And not only that, but it's actually going to be, I think that the full text will be freely available to everyone. So everyone will be actually able to check out the study. You won't need to go to Sci-Hub or try to get a buddy to, to get a <laughs> from the university or anything like that. So, um, um, and so, I mean, I can pretty much freely talk about that study now. I mean, I mean, basically uh, that study we had, um, uh, there were three groups. One group did one set per exercise. Another group did three sets per exercise. Another group did five sets per exercise. Um, and they trained three times, uh, did whole body workouts three days a week. Um, and so the five, um, and it was all compound movements, except they also had some leg extensions in there. Um, and the group that did five sets per exercise was doing, if you, you know, count, they were doing squats, leg press and leg extension every session, five sets each of, you know, around 10 reps. Um, so that's 45 weekly sets they were doing on their quads basically. Um, and we found a dose response relationship um, three sets was more than one set and five sets had the greatest gains. And in fact, if you look at uh, responders and non-responders, there were, there were very few non-responders in the highest volume group. Um, um, and they were probably doing 
as far as upper body, probably around, you know, we measured triceps and biceps, and I think there it was around probably 30 weekly sets, I think, on the highest volume group. Um, so um, that study's going to, you know, get a lot of attention. Uh, so, but, uh, um, so yeah, guys, be checking out for that one. That'll be yeah. out very soon. Um, we do have a, uh, a paper that's been submitted on a meta-analysis on, on uh, training frequency and uh, hypertrophy, an update from the one we did a few years ago. Um, I can't talk about the results of that one, but, but that's you know, basically going to be in review. Um, uh, trying to think. Um, don't have anything else that I can th think of. Um, oh, there's also a study that should, I can't talk about the results yet, um, but there is a study that's been in review and it should be published, probably published ahead of print soon. So I can't talk about the details until it's at least uh, announced that it'll be published, but um, comparing uh, training muscle groups uh, six times per week com compared to three days per week. So a very high frequency train volume equated. So, so that's one that uh, should be out soon, hopefully. Um, so that's kind of in, in the review process right now. So um, that's, that's all I know of, um, at least the stuff that I've been involved in, so. Yeah. Awesome. Quick question for you on uh, the volume study comparing one, three, and five sets. Uh, what training level of advancement were the participants and how long did the study go for? So the study went for eight weeks and they, these were well-trained guys. Um, I don't know if, it, you know, I don't know if any of you guys have seen pictures of, of the subjects in Brad Schoenfeld's studies, but these are pretty jack dudes. <laughs> so these are well-trained guys. You know, these aren't, these aren't people with just a year of weight training experience, you know. Um, these are well-trained guys, so, um, yeah. Man, this study's going to be epic. I think it's going to blow the socks off uh, the entire uh, evidence-based community. So, yeah. guys, we'll uh, keep you updated and make sure that you have access to that one. And James will, I'm sure, answer any questions you guys may have. Next question. How would you give if a client is doing enough work for muscle gain short term? Obviously, muscle gain is a long-term endeavor, but with the new research showing quite a broad range of total weekly sets being viable to different individuals, um, in terms of finding that sweet spot, is it more a rate of progression with weights, how well recovered they are, whether they think uh, the work is enough, or combinations of something completely different? So this is a really good question that I think, uh, yeah, many coaches will be uh, scratching their heads thinking, am I doing enough with my clients are they you know progressing appropriately how do i know muscle gain is so hard to measure james what do you think yeah and that, that's a really good question and you know in the past if you'd asked me that question i would have been like well hey if they're uh if they're progressing in their weights and stuff it, it should be fine well the, the, again i want to mention about this volume study you know we also measured strength and so even though the highest volume group had the greatest hypertrophy Strength gains were the same between the low, medium, and high volume groups. Mm -hmm. So the low volume group was progressing. They were progressing in strength as much as the high volume group was, but they weren't necessarily gaining the size along with it. So, um, so that makes it really difficult. Um, you know, what, what can be the best proxy then, you know, um, if, if, if it's looking like the strength gains in the gym aren't necessarily correlating with hypertrophy. Um, now, what I will say, and I have to look at the data further, um, I, I don't have all the training data yet. Um, I have some of the training data from the first cohort of subjects, but not the second cohort that he ran. Mm -hmm. um, but when I kind of took a peek at the first cohort of subjects, what was interesting is, and this kind of relates to something I wrote in the research review um, about isolation versus compound movements. So like I said, in this, uh, in this study, um, it was almost all compound movements except leg extensions were done in the legs. And um, what was interesting is, at least when I looked at the first quarter subjects, the rate of, of improvement in the gym was pretty much the same among all the groups. Um, if anything, it was even a little bit better in the low volume group because they weren't, didn't have as much cumulative fatigue. Except for the leg extension, there was a noticeable difference in the improvement in the leg extension as far as uh, their ability to improve in the highest volume groups, which gets to my thought that 
changes in your performance in your isolation movements may be more reflective of hypertrophy mm -hmm. than changes in performance in your compound movements. And so I would suggest that um, um, you want to look at how are you progressing in isolation movements? And not only how are you progressing, but are you progressing across all the sets that you're doing? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's also really important. So if you're doing five sets of leg extension, you should be seeing improvement across all five sets and not just say your first set and then you're fatigued and your, your four other four sets are still the same, like they're not really improving. Um, you should be progressing across all those sets. I think if you're doing that, then I would say over the short term, that's probably the best proxy for hypertrophy you're going to get. So yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And you were the one, James, who actually started to bring this stuff uh, to my attention. And something else that I've been uh, thinking about more specifically as it relates to like how we measure this. Um, you know, we obviously want to be getting stronger. We want to be getting stronger across number of sets and all of our exercises within the week. I guess that's the easiest way to look at it. Uh, but what people actually do is they intentionally manipulate their volume um, either by, you know, taking rest days, doing a little bit less work. And then that like enhances their performance um, in a given session. And they hit a PB and they go, I must be gaining muscle. Um, so I guess something else to factor into what, what James has said is also keeping fatigue consistent. And that sounds a little bit weird and almost backwards to say, because it's like, well, you know, we don't want to be training fatigue. It was like, yes, but the cumulative fatigue should be consistent because if we're tapering our training, um, intentionally taking rest days or, you know, even having longer, you know, time between sessions where, you know, re recovery is going to be better, you know, the fatigue will drop and our performance will increase in that session. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're, um, you know, making progress. Um, because we know, you know, the fitness fatigue model, uh, performance is a function of fitness minus fatigue. Um, so if we're dropping fatigue and hitting PBs, maybe that's not necessarily indicative of muscle gain. Um, it's just expressing strength. We're not actually building that repetition strength in, in the same or similar conditions um, to, to what we need to be. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, James. It's just something that I've been uh, thinking about recently. Yeah, no, I would totally agree with that because, uh, and I think that's, I think what you're, you're, you're touching on something, something I experienced all over my years of training. It's actually something that I was kind of guilty of myself. Um, you know, a lot of my early years of training, I did, I was, I wasn't a, a, a hitter, HIT guy, but I was close to it. And a lot of my training was fairly low volume. And it was because, because I noticed better strength gains when I trained that way. Um, I just felt more recovered. I, I, I seemed to be more consistent in my strength gains. But I never really built the physique. I mean, I got more muscular, but I just kind of looked athletic looking, right? I went from being skinny, skinny to kind of athletic looking, but I didn't really, like, really get, you know, jacked on that type of training. Um, and at the time, I was just confusing strength, strength gains with muscle gains, but it, it gets to what you were saying, and I think that's why some people tend to fall into the trap of doing HIT training, because what they'll do is they'll, they'll, they'll be doing this high volume training, they feel like they're not progressing, they switch to a HIT program, and suddenly they see their strength gains, their strength go through the roof because they're getting all this recovery, and they think, oh, I must be gaining all this muscle now. I mean, obviously I was training with too much volume before, um, but they're not actually gaining more muscle, they're they've their fatigue has come way down and now their performance in their gym is reflecting that so yeah yeah and that's exactly right i've seen that as well so yeah i think it's an important consideration to have um but yeah as james said rep strength across multiple sets across multiple exercises in the same and similar conditions you know in terms of fatigue and i think uh that's the best proxy Cool. Next question. What's an area where you're struggling to figure out how to apply research findings to yourself uh, or clients as an individual? Um, oh, that's a really good question. Um, hmm. You can tell people that you don't struggle to apply research, James. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I'd love to say that, but it's like, 
and maybe that's not, um, I wouldn't say that I struggle to apply research filings, but I think I want to word it a little, I would probably word it a little di differently. I think research can't always tell us enough. Um, so, you know, like I said, research can be a general guide and sometimes it can be very vague as a guide. And so you still have to sometimes use either your intuition or your personal experience or things like that when you're programming for clients. Cause you know, a, a study can't tell you do X, X, you know, X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it more tells you, um, yeah, X kind of works, seems to work a little bit better than, than program A does, but program A might work better in certain situations. And like, um, it, 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 at best, it gives you general guidelines and that, that can be very vague. And I think that's where I can str even struggle with myself sometimes mm -hmm. because um, even, you know, this new volume study that's coming out, it's like, okay, well, how do I apply that to myself, especially me? You know, this was on young jacked guys, and I'm like, I'm 44 years old now and have had joint issues and stuff like that. Obviously, I can't train with that type of volume. Um, so, but how can I at least take some of the concepts of increasing my volume and do it on myself, you know, whether it's through, you know, rest pause techniques or something like that, you know, that's where the experimentation comes to play. But unfortunately we don't have much research on rest pause to really say, you know, how can I equate that with, you know, full volume training and maybe it doesn't equate, you know, who knows. So I would say that's probably the area I seem tend to struggle with the most is just, there's still a lot of unknowns. And, and so you're still, there's still a lot of guesswork involved. Um, especially with training diet, not so much. Um, I would say my biggest struggle with nutrition is just, um, and I, I would say this is an uh, experience all coaches have is the FAMA is, is clients under reporting mm. their food intake. And unfortunately we, you know, we have no control over that. That's just something we know happens and how to deal with it is, is, you know, the research doesn't tell us a whole lot on how to handle under reporting. There are some tricks you can do, but it doesn't always work. Um, you know, uh, so that's something I struggle with, with my clients, uh, you know, cause I know I'll, I have some clients who are under reporting their calorie intake and I'll try different things to see if I can, you know, either get them to report more accurately or maybe kind of trick them a little bit, you know, maybe I'll give them a higher calorie target, um, which then, um, gives them a more realistically achievable calorie intake, which then they are more adherent that way. So. You know, there's different tricks you can do there, but that's another, that's an area I tend to struggle with myself. So. Awesome, James. I really like that. And I guess, yeah, for me, it, it's just very much the same in, you know, the ambiguity of research and, you know, being able to bridge the gap uh, from, you know, the science and then into practice is always something uh, that's very challenging, but, you know, I guess the areas that, you know, I'd, I'm looking into currently and more so, you know, the measuring of volume um, because, you know, I love when people have debates and conversations online, they're like, they talk about volume, but people aren't even speaking the same language. It means something different to everyone yeah. else. So for me, it's about, you know, how do we measure volume? You know, obviously a uh, number of hardworking sets per week is the current uh, practice that most coaches, myself included, uh, employ. It's very easy to use. Um, obviously, there's a few caveats to that. Um, but yeah, the whole effective reps concept has intrigued me uh, so much. So I'm looking into that now. I've obviously looked at James's article on that, uh, Chris Beardsley, and you know, looking into Borges Vajerle, his work. Um, so yeah, all of that stuff is really interesting. Um, but I'm yet to really refine it to a point where, um, you know, I can apply it in, in my coaching and have some, you know, meaningful uh, benefit from using that stuff just yet. Um, but yeah, I guess that's, that's an area I'm looking at. Cool. Next question, exercise selection for long-term programming. I program every five weeks. Uh, so in five week blocks, I tend to change up most of the exercises every block. This is time consuming. How long would you keep these same exercises? Perhaps vary up others, volume, intensity, and frequencies as your way of showing variety and progression until you decide it's time to vary up the workout. So I guess this is really important because most gen pop clients or novices, they get really bored with the program. Like yeah. athletes and stuff, they can do whatever it takes to, to get the result. But, you know, a lot of the time 
people who just go to the gym as a hobby uh, get bored. So I think this is going to help a lot of people. James, what's your approach here? Yeah, so um, I would say that uh, I think it totally depends on the individual. So, um, um, you know, I don't think there's any approach where you need to vary ex exercise five weeks. And I would say, um, you know, if you're doing that for every client, you don't need to do that. Um, but um, uh, you don't need to do it for every client. Now, if you do have a client that wants a lot of variety, like I have one client where I got to give them a new program every four weeks, you know. <laughs> um, but I don't necessarily change the exercises every four weeks. Um, sometimes I'll change the rep ranges. Um, sometimes what I might do is, uh, you know, even keep the same rep ranges, but maybe I'll throw in some intensity techniques or, you know, drop sets or, or something like that, do something a little bit different along those lines. I might vary the exercises a little bit, like, but I might keep a core group of exercises um, and then switch some accessories, you know, things like that. Um, I think that's, uh, you know, one way that you can do it. Um, but um, yeah, I, I don't think there's any right answer to this. Mm. Um, Uh, yeah, I, there's no, I, I, I wish I could give you an answer, say, okay, well change every exercise every eight weeks or, or do something like that. But unfortunately, like it, at least I know for me with myself, it's very client dependent on how often I change their exercises. Um, but even the ones that I, like I said, that I change more frequently, I try to keep enough consistency in exercise selection to where at least have a pretty good idea of whether they're progressing or not. So, um, and that tends to make it a little bit easier because I don't need to be doing radically different exercises every four weeks, you know? Um, uh, Cause yeah, I mean, um, you know, if you're changing most of the exercises every block, and especially if they're radically different exercises, um, yeah, it can be really time consuming and not, and it's not totally necessary, you know? Um, uh, so like I said, I think you can introduce variety through other ways other than changing the exercises. Like I said, changing the rep ranges, introducing intensity techniques, changing, changing volume, even just things like changing the volume, um, you know, changing the exercise order. There are a lot of other things that you can do without necessarily having to, to vary the exercises every time, so. Yeah, I, I'll just uh, add to that. James is spot on. There's no right way to do this. Um, but what I often do with a lot of my clients is I'll have like priority one movements where, you know, I explain to them that these are the movements we need to keep in the program like consistently because we have to make progress on these. Are you cool with that? Are you happy to perform this movement, you know, for, you know, eight weeks plus, um, once we come to a mutual, you know, agreement as to what that movement is for, you know, like a squat, um, a hinge pattern, a horizontal and vertical push, horizontal, vertical pull, so on and so forth. Um, and then I'll have priority two movements. We just say, cool, we can rotate these ones a little more frequently, but not all the time. Um, so, you know, pick wisely and we'll go, cool. So, you know, we want a quad dominant movement. We'll go through again. We have, you know, isolations, accessory work here. And then there are priority three uh, exercises where it's like, I'll let you choose. We can rotate these every four to five weeks, like a bicep curl, a side raise, you know, upright row, things that aren't very, uh, you know, technical or don't have a high, you know, skill component um, and I'll let them choose. So I think, you know, if you try to have some, you know, discussions with your clients about, you know, what they need to do versus what they want to do um, and then come to an understanding, hopefully that can, you know, help you program more effectively rather than just having to give them what they want all the time. Because if you, if they're a baby and you're just having to, you know, feed them on call kind of thing, it's like, well, yeah, they may not necessarily be, you know, getting the results that they want to be getting. Cool. When do you think it's appropriate and in which circumstances to use a flexible training approach as well as an intuitive eating approach? It would be interesting to know your opinion about personality type and type of programming and periodization, both according to what you've learned through practice and what the research says. So this is two questions from Laura here. Um, so we'll start off with flexible training uh, and intuitive eating, James. Yeah, so that, that's a really good train. Um, as far as a flexible training approach, um, really for me at least, uh, totally depends on the client and their schedule and everything. Um, I 
basically I always uh, try to learn as much as I can about a client's, you know, their work schedule, their, you know, schedule at home, you know, what days they have available to train, things like that. Um, and so if it's, if, if I can sense it's a client that's going to need more flexibility, um, as far as, uh, you know, where and when they can train, then I'll, then I'll use a much more flexible approach, um, uh, as far as, you know, frequency and, and things like that. Um, you know, like I said, if it's a client that likes variety, then what I might do is rather than choosing specific exercises for them, I'll give them, uh, you know, um, I might just say, listen, I want you to do a, a push, a, a horizontal push movement of some type. Um, uh, here's three or four examples, and you can choose, you know, maybe about these four examples, um, things like that. You know, so I'll use a flexible approach, you know, that way. Um, uh, you know, and it also depends on things like, you know, client's injury status and things like that. Um, intuitive eating is a, is a tough one. Um, I will only use... For me, I will only use intuitive eating in situations where I, I feel that the client, um, number one, um, has, as far as the, the types of foods they eat, are fairly high quality, and most of their diet is fairly high quality foods. Because intuitive eating, a lot of it's based on your physiological signals, uh, mm -hmm. as far as hunger and satiety and things like that. And... Um, you know, if your diet is not comprised of mostly whole foods and, you know, let me put it this way. And if you, if it fits your macros approach, doesn't, doesn't work with intuitive eating, uh, in a sense, because, um, you know, if, and if it fits your macros approach, um, you know, you've got a lot more, you've got a lot of flexibility in your food choices, but those food choices may not necessarily be as satiating. And so it's not really going to work, you know, I'll use an extreme example. You know, if you're trying to do intuitive eating while eating at McDonald's all the time, uh, it's not going to work. You know, well, it's kind of an extreme example, but you know, if you're if you're if your calorie sources are, tend to be more energy dense, they tend to be more highly palatable. You're going to intuitively eat more than especially if than, you're exposed to more food all the time. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's some limitations to that. There's also limitations to intuitive eating just with any general weight loss client, especially someone who's, um, who's losing a fair amount of body fat or body weight um, because the natural upregulation and hunger signals that occurs when you lose weight. And so intuitive eating can be very challenging in that sense. Um, I would say intuitive eating probably works better with a client who um, perhaps is more in a maintenance mode and they have a lot of experience. But like I said, the, the, most of their foods come from whole foods. Um, they're very in tune with their bodies as far as what's true, um, true physiological hunger versus, you know, versus oh. like emotional eating, things like that. Yeah. Um, so, so I'd say in those situations, intuitive eating can work better. Um, but uh, I, I think it's very, uh, it really depends on the individual. Um, I tend not to use intuitive eating approaches with my clients, but most of my clients are gen pop weight loss clients. Um, and like I said, you know, um, there are, and a lot of them are, are, are just kind of learning how to eat and eat more properly and things like that. And in those situations, intuitive eating just doesn't really work very well. So awesome. And yeah, I would just say that you need to essentially learn how to track calories and macros and then learn the habits and behaviors you need to employ to manage your weight. Um, and then also learn, you know, about your own hunger and satiety cues. Um, and then you can have a more, you know, free, you know, freedom based diet. Um, but even then, there's still constraints around that because you, it's not completely intuitive. Uh, we just, yeah. you know, I think Eric Helms uh, referred to it as habit-based eating. And I think I really like that term a lot more. Yeah. Because if we eat by intuition, um, yeah, probably not good for, for our health and fitness. Well, that's the thing. If I went off my intuition, I'd probably be eating Thai food all the time. And like, you know. <laughs> yeah. 
I feel you, man. And the second part of uh, Laura's question was relating to personality types and how we program and uh, periodize training and what we've learned through practice and what the research says. You know, I haven't really looked at, you know, when you say personality type, you know, I, I don't know if maybe if you're referring to, you know, type A versus type B personalities, maybe, you know, um, that type. Um, I, I don't know of any research on that myself personally um, that, have, that has tried to look at personality types and what um, tends to work for certain people versus others. Um, so given that, I tend to kind of just basically wing it with my clients, um, you know, based on the sense that I get, you know, um, I, 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 you know, if I have a client who tends to have a very uh, rigid mentality on things, um, you know, going for a full blown flexible approach, a lot of times sometimes doesn't totally work with that. Um, so I try to ease them over into a more flexible approach, you know, um, uh, um, and at the same time, uh, with some people, um, a really, really flexible approach to start with sometimes uh, doesn't totally work because like you had said about people's habits, sometimes you got to have a little bit more of a rigid approach to start with to get the habits developed and then you can introduce some more flexibility. So uh, it's just, I wish I could have a better answer for this question. I think it just really depends on the person uh, uh, from one person to the next. Yeah, I think just paying attention to your client and seeing where they where they're at, what they need currently, and where you know where they need to be down the track, and then slowly, um, you know, transitioning from you know what's necessary and practical right now to you know what is theoretically optimal and going to get them the best results. And it's just this constant process of you know trying to adjust our expectations a little bit but always strive you know to improve things so yeah i think james uh hit that one on the you know nail on the head because it's way too individualized to you know give specific answers about personality types because we work with so many different people and they're all uh requiring something different in many uh cases um what are your favorite resources on periodization? Also, your thoughts on the book Super Training, worth a read or overly hyped? Um, and this is the last question. Yeah. I mean, I will just, I mean, to be totally honest, I don't really have a favorite resource on periodization because to me, periodization is a very, very vague concept. Um, uh, to me, periodization just means varying your your training program in a systematic way to try to ensure continued progress mm -hmm. and there's so there's so many different ways to do that um i i don't really have i would say a, a favorite resource on it um uh um you know as far as the book super training um i've actually it's funny i actually have the book but i've never read it um uh mel Sif, mel Sif, when when he was still alive uh, the book, but I just never, um, I never had a chance to read it. Um, I've, so, actually, I've actually got it here. <laughs> yeah. So I, I can't really give a, a educated opinion on it because, um, cause like I said, I've never actually really read the book thoroughly. And, and what's interesting is even if I had back then, you know, because, you know, this was back in, you know, he sent me that book probably around 2001 or, you know, I mean, it's been, uh, you know, seven, uh, um, yeah, 17 years, I think, since he sent me that book. And my opinions have changed a lot since then. So even if I had read it back then, um, I probably wouldn't even remember what I, what it had said. And uh, if I were to read it now, you know, I'd have to read it now and then kind of look at, you know, well, how does that match up with what we know now, you know, mm. to at least give an opinion of it. So yeah i think uh with any book it's you know important to remember that the information's outdated as soon as it's published yeah <laughs> that's why you should subscribe to weightology.net and <laughs> the latest research james come on that was your cue man no but <laughs> thank you very much uh for your time today and answering uh our mentorship students questions Guys, I hope you found that informative and I hope it was useful. Uh, make sure that you do check out weightology.net.
James puts out some superb content. Um, and you guys will learn a hell of a lot about, you know, physiology of fat loss, muscle growth, you know, everything in between. So, so I do recommend it. I'm subscribed. I have been for, I think almost like four to five years now, um, which is pretty cool. I think, I think that's a, a little milestone that I've hit. I'm proud of that one. Um, so yeah, make sure you check it out. Follow James's work and we'll speak to you all next time. Thanks, James. Yeah, thanks.